This is the Power of Kinship, a special edition of the Life Talk Show, People Helping People. I'm Randy Kay. Well, we all know the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, and boy, is that true. Today's Life Talk Show is a Power of Kinship edition, People Helping People. I'm an audiobook narrator, and when there's a book I narrate that changes my life, I always want to share. This book is called Why Is My Child in Charge? It's one of those special books from the first chapter. I found useful and loving techniques with the preschoolers in my life that worked like a charm. So join me now for a chat with the author, Claire Lerner. Her website is learnerchilddevelopment.com. The book will be released on September 2nd, 2021, but available for pre order now. Listen for a special offer at the end. Meanwhile, let's dive right in with Claire. She's a child development specialist with over 30 years of experience working with children and families. Part of that, leading the parenting education work at the highly esteemed organization Zero to Three. But as you'll hear, the techniques extend way beyond that. Welcome, Claire. Claire, welcome to Power of Kinship. I'm so excited to meet you. I'm, I'm thrilled to meet you, and I just love that we made this connection through your narrating my book, which was so hard for me to picture, like <laughs> someone actually like speaking out loud these words in this way. So it's just, it's, it's a total thrill for me to, to do this with you. Well, it's very good. And I have to say that when I started narrating it and, you know, as, as the narrator, full disclosure, we don't get royalties, book sales don't affect what I make as a living, but I'm a huge believer in books and the messages that they send. And I just think your messages are not just only so important. <laughs> the noise you hear outside is two of those grandchildren playing in the pool with my husband and their mother and they have strict orders not to come up here. Um, as I just, this book just resonated with me, not just for the tips that proved so useful, but as we'll see in a minute, just the way you organize them into eight mind shifts that made a difference. And today, this is Claire Lerner. The name of the book is, why don't you say it? Why is my child in charge? <laughs> Isn't that, honestly, when I put that on Facebook, I'm in a group called A Voice Over Moms, and all of them were like, I need that book. I need that book. So, well, you know, actually, um, a, a, one of my closest friends who has a lot of skill in PR and communications came up with it. And, and the question she asked me when she was trying to help me come up with the title was, when families come to see you, what is the heart of the matter? What is the problem that they're really trying to solve? And as we talked, it became very clear that the main, the main dynamic that was at play that led parents to seek out my help was that things had gotten completely upside down and their child was essentially sort of driving the proverbial family car. And they were reacting to um to the child as a vote as a as opposed to the way it should be which is being a loving leader um and they felt like they had lost complete control in a way that was very unhealthy for everybody involved parents and children alike um, and so that was the genesis of the title it really captured and you know, just tapped right into the zeitgeist of what so many parents feel during these early years. And, and I can say that, yes, I mean, the title is fantastic and the book lives up to the title. And very often that's not the case. So I will, uh, obviously, since I'm a grandmother, I am a mother, I raised a boy and a girl and I raised them in the era, you know, we're both mothers of grown children. I raised them in the era when give a child a choice, empower them, blah, 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 blah. But I can also see that it went too far. When my kids were grown, I said to myself, if I could have changed one thing as a parent, I would have said, because I said so more often, maybe not in those words, but just taking the mantle of being in charge of my family. But I love how you put it as loving leadership in a loving way. So what I'd love to do, tell me just a bit more about your background and your business, and then we'll, we'll get to the nitty gritty. Maybe we can help a few families with this podcast. That would be great. Well, I'm a clinical social worker by, by training and education. 
And um, I have done many, many things in the early childhood space very quickly. And, and of course, folks can learn more about me through my website, which I'm which sure is, you'll promote. It's just learnerchilddevelopment.com. Great. Or you can Google me, Claire Learner. So um, I'm a clinician by training. I started out by doing child and family therapy. Um, then I got very involved in a national nonprofit called Zero to Three, which is based in Washington, which supports any adult who is supporting a young child, policymakers, parents, professionals, and in capacity. I did a lot of research and writing on early development, which is sort of what developed my writing. Um, my focus on translating the science of early childhood for parents and caregivers. Um, and at the same time, I developed a private practice um, through pediatricians I was working with to support them in supporting families. And that has just grown exponentially. And so I left zero to three, so exclusively on my direct service work with physicians. And so what I do is um, I meet families um, and, and collaborate with them to pull through um, the online meaning of their young children's behavior to really get to the root cause um, so that we can come up with strategies that actually address the driving force and not just the behavior itself because those strategies rarely work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so, um, and I also do a lot of preschool consultation. I do a lot of work in pediatrics. Um, but that's the focus of my practice is really supporting families, um, to address what can be these vexing early challenges with their kids. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. And we'll put all the links in the description and people can get in touch with you. And at, at the end, we've got a special offer if people want to purchase your book. I believe the official date is September 2nd. And often the audiobook comes out the same day and Tantor Media has produced the audiobook. But let's get to some advanced information. What I love about this is you, you get to it right away. You get to the eight mind shifts right away. And then the rest of the book is categories that I know parents of young kids struggle with. Food issues, getting dressed in the morning issues, sleep issues, potty training. Like all of those things are in your book. And then you pepper it with stories and as a professional speaker, I know people remember stories. So uh, let's just get right to it. A mind shift is a mindset you didn't know you had, and then you want to kind of reword it to think differently. Does that kind of sum it up? Yes. Yeah, so, so essentially, you know, when I started this endeavor, I, I never set out to write a parenting book. I read a lot of blogs and articles on, you know, issues that my family struggle with. Um, but what happened was family after family came, many had lots and lots of excellent, excellent parenting books that I rely on, uh, but there, there was something missing, which was even though all the parents know, when they come into my office, they know that power struggles are unhealthy, that yelling is not a good strategy, that bribery and negotiation um, are, are also not, not, not very effective ultimately, they're still doing it. They're, they, they, there's like this delta between what they know and what they're doing in the moment. And so I started to realize as I would unpack these scenarios with parents in great detail about like what their child did, what their reaction was, how the whole thing cascaded and unfolded, I started to realize that there were some key mindsets, the starting point um, in the parent's brain, the lens through which they were seeing these encounters that was sending them down a path of frustration and major power struggles with their kids. And that was the missing piece, was getting to what was actually the root cause of their own behavior towards their child. Mm -hmm. And once we were able to make mind shifts, things evolved in a much more positive way where they were able to 
set the limits and boundaries kids desperately need, but in a loving way. And so the, the basis of the book is elucidating those eight mind shifts, which of course we can go into. Mm -hmm. And as you said, after I elucidate those mind shifts, telling many stories to make it sort of really real and relatable to parents. So parents can see themselves in these stories um, and get that aha moment. Then I have chapters where we go in deep on like tantrums, right? So I, and I, I elucidate for readers the process that I go through with each family, sort of what the presenting issue is, what the mindsets that were in place that were obstacles to the parents being doing what they wanted to do and what they know they should do for their child in right. those moments, the mind shifts they made through our work together, and then the plan they were able to put in place and the outcome of having made this mind shift, um, which enabled them to then use the strategies effectively to really support their young children and, um, and reduce these challenging behaviors through really setting loving limits. Yeah, absolutely. And I will, I know because this is, this show is under an hour, probably be about 45 minutes. And I got to say in the back of my mind, it's like, maybe she and I will do a talk show and we'll do episodes where we'll invite parents. And I don't know, but I just know, I'm just going to use my own family as an example. So I, I don't think we'll have time to delve into every single one of the mind shifts, but let me start with a story. What I love about your book is you give us language to use from the get-go with that story about a kid that didn't want to get out of the pool. So after I narrated that chapter, and obviously I read the whole book before, but when you narrate, you really get into the author's head as best you can. And it really sinks in because you're reading out loud. And that's a brain process that, that I love. Not so much when I'm narrating about the sex life of a fruit fly, but definitely with, with your books. <laughs> so um, my daughter has three kids. Will, if anyone knows me, they know their names, but in the interest of sort of privacy, we'll just name them by uh, letters. We have E, who's five and a half. She's a girl. We have F, who's almost four. She's a girl. And what I learned from your book is an HS or highly sensitive child. And then we have H, who is a boy who was born 13 months after F. And so he's going to be three in September. So, all right. So F is our HS child. And she, she's the one that has the tantrums. She is the one that overreacts. She is the one. We don't know. Is it because she's a middle child? Is it her? Like you talked about development, temperament, and then there's birth order. And, you know, there's all kinds of things. So the littlest thing will set her off. I hadn't had this. I'd had it a little bit with my son, but not so my daughter was a pretty easy girl. And so F, it was time to take a bath. And all of a sudden the switch flipped. She started screaming hysterically. She didn't want to take a bath. She's got a booboo on her foot. She can't put the foot in the water, you know, the whole thing. And one thing I learned from your book is you can't talk logic to a kid who is stuck in their amygdala or wherever it is that they're only feeling emotion. So the mind shifts that went through my head is, I don't know which number it is, but here you go. Number four, the mindset was experiencing difficult emotions is harmful to my child. And I replaced it with your new mind shift number five, which is taking me a long time to scroll down to, but uh, basically it's not harmful. She, she needs to, she's like a steam kettle needing to let off some steam. And I allowed her her feelings and Using the mind shifts, it was, I said, you know what? You have two great choices here, <laughs> straight out of your book. You got two great choices. First of all, know that the bath is going to happen. So you're not going to win. And I don't, I don't like that phrase. That was mine. And I cut that out because winning is not a good thing. I said, the bath is going to happen. You got two great choices. You can either climb in by yourself or grandma will be a helper and I'll help you get in the tub. And it's the tone of voice. I learned this all from your book. It's the tone of voice, not like you versus me, but just like it is going to happen. That's a directive, not a choice. Yes, you are going to bed. Yes, you, yes, you are getting in your car seat. For me, that was another mind shift, learning the difference between, you know, a choice has to be a real choice. Either one is okay. 
but they all have consequences. But a directive is, and I loved when you said in preschool, the kids don't protest when it's not their turn to be line leader. That's just the way it is in school, but at home they will. So I'm like, you got two great choices. And, and then she couldn't think. Then she's like, I, it's, I can't decide. And so straight out of Clear Learner's book, I said, you know, making decisions is difficult. You know what, Grammy's gonna wait just a second until you make up your mind, but I'm gonna set my timer. I'll give you a minute. Would you like to pick the sound? Immediately she stopped crying. Like I have a timer on my iPhone and it was hard for her, but you know, eventually she climbed into the tub herself and I didn't have to escalate to to worrying that the tantrum was hurting her or to screaming at her to exert my authority. I, and I knew this as a parent, but you need refreshers when you become a grandparent. Staying calm and loving is the best technique. So there was a lot of mind shifts that went on there yeah. and she took her bath and the tantrum ended. And occasionally she still has a tantrum over what I would think is nothing. And the mind shift to not worry so much about it has been huge for me because I think in the back of my mind, I was trying to avoid tantrums. And it's like when I teach customer service, which I do on occasion, uh, you know, you can't say to an angry customer, don't be mad or calm down, ma'am. Like that does not work. That only makes them angrier. So anyway, so that's an example. So can you kind of run down the eight mind shifts for me? And then uh, if there's a story or I have a story of how it worked for me, I think that would be a great way to do it. So yeah, actually the story you just told Randy is perfect because it really, it encompasses so many of the mind shifts, right? So the first mind shift, I mean, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The mindset, right? So the, what I think of as faulty mindsets first starts with my child is misbehaving on purpose, right? He should be able to accept these limits and exhibit greater self-control. Right. So now let's go back to your story. So you have a, um, a three-year-old, uh, five and a half, oh, let's just say five and a half, four and three. Cause they're right. Crazy. So she's the four-year-old, right? So we have a young child, right. Who is having a hard time making this transition to bath. So the first mindset is if you perceive your child in that moment to be misbehaving, you are much more likely to go down a path of harsh, punitive, you know, if you don't get in the tub, you know, all sorts of either threats or rewards, right, to try and control their behavior and get her to comply. Okay. Mm -hmm. So exactly. So, and it also another mind mindset that could could definitely be at play in that scenario for most parents with a child, you know, being defiant or oppositional is not just that they're misbehaving on purpose, but that um, the tantrum or upset is inherently harmful to them and that you have to make those feelings go away because those feelings are bad for them. So you see how these these mindsets sort of coalesce and cascade into interactions that can become can, can result in a protracted power struggle like you said me versus you someone here is going to be a winner someone here is going to be a loser and in that scenario everybody loses mm -hmm. um so and and then you also have the mindset of giving children specific directions is dictatorial. A lot of families, when I work with them and I, I watch them, there's a lot of um, time to clean up, okay? Time to get in pajamas, okay? And kids are very, very tuned in and they hear that as a question, as a choice. And when I ask parents why it's hard to say it's time to get in the bath or it's time to get in the car seat, they, at a cellular level, feel like they're being dictatorial, which by the way, goes back to something you said earlier, which is our generation and still this generation too, gets the message that children need agency, children need a sense of control. Absolutely. 
but within appropriate limits. I had I had two moms I worked with recently who told me they came to me, you know, with with a with a four year old also who was sort of running the show, and they said, you know, we really wanted her to have a voice and 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 have efficacy um, and feel really good about herself. But now she thinks she's an equity partner. By the way, they, they were lawyers, <laughs> so that's that's their vernacular. I so love you it. Can, it's fantastic. So so um. Right there, you've got uh, uh, three different mindsets. My child's misbehaving on purpose. The, 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 the difficult feelings are harmful. Giving a clear direction is, um, is, is being a dictator. Now I'm going to add another one, which is that I can control and change my child's behavior, right? Which means like I can make her get into the bath. You actually pause. The... The most humbling thing about parenting that nobody tells you about is that you have zero control over your child, Mm. meaning you can't make them do anything. You can't make a child get into the bathtub. I mean, you can put them in the, but you can't make them. You can't make them clean up your toys. You can't make them pee or poop on the body. You can't make them sleep. Those are all fizzy, any, their voice in their body they're the only ones who control that. What you control is your actions and reactions and how you respond in those moments that therefore affect the choices your child makes. So you gave a great example, Randy, about how you, because you had read the book and you were aware of the mindsets that might've caught you and sent you into that power struggle, instead you were able to recognize I can't make her get in the bathtub, but I can give her two great choices. One is she does it herself, but the second one is an end game. It's something you could make happen to move the situation along and not get caught in what I call the gray zone. The gray zone is when parents are hoping against hope that threats, bribery, cajoling, using logic are going to ultimately get their child to change their mind. But that means that the outcome of the interaction is completely dependent on your child agreeing to get in the bathtub or get Mm -hmm. in the car seat or stay in their room at night. So what if they decide not to, then where are you? Then you're frustrated, you're angry. If you don't stay in your room, there's no TV next week or for a year um, or, you know, whatever. You're not going to the party tomorrow. And and especially, and this I remember from my parenting, don't make a threat you can't follow up on. Uh. Right. Plus the thing is threats also, one is, it's dependent on your child being cowed by the threat. I've had so many scenarios where a child, like the dad the other day, mom was working, she wasn't supposed to go into the room and the dad's sitting there going, you know, you can't go bother mommy. If you bother mommy, you're not gonna get your video later. And she literally looked at him and said, I don't care about my video, ran up and charged into the mom's room while she was working. So let me just take that scenario. Sure. In, in, in this model, what you would be doing is this you would be saying, I'll call her Sarah. Sarah, I know, I totally get it. It's really hard for you to not be able to see mommy when she's working, totally get it, right? So now I'm moving to mind shifts. Talking children out of their feelings, there's nothing right or wrong about feelings, they just are. It's managing the feelings that matters. And the more you validate a child's feelings, the, the greater the chance that they'll ultimately be able to understand and look at those feelings and manage them and have the self-regulation that we're all so um, eager for children to have because of the, the very positive outcomes it leads to for children who are able to manage when they can't get what they want when they want it. So you start with, I totally get it, sweetie, totally get it. And I know you don't like our role. We don't expect you to like it. Why would you like the fact that you can't see mommy right now, but that's a mommy daddy decision. Mommy needs to work. So you've got two great choices. You can stay down here. We can play. We can find something else to do. If you choose to try to get in the room, I'm going to be a helper and we'll stay in this room with the door closed where I can make sure that you can follow the rule. Those are your two great choices. 
you have to have an end game because if you're sitting there going, that's it, sweetie. If you go in mommy's room, then there's no TV later. She rejects right. the threat. Or you alternatively say, oh, you know, I'll give you a lollipop if you don't bother mommy. And what if she says, I don't care about the lollipop. So, so you're in the gray zone, hoping against hope that she's finally going to say, you know, you're right. Mommy really does need to work. So it would be a much better idea if I just focused on something else for this hour. No, like I don't know any three or four or five-year-old who's going to say that. So you can't appeal case, to their logic because their frontal cortex is nowhere near exactly. where, where a 25-year-old frontal cortex is. And so all of those things, and I will, let me just add here, I, I am a grandmother. And one of the things I'm proudest of is the minute my daughter was pregnant, I said to her, you're the mother. From this moment on, whatever you choose to do, I will follow your rules. I am not going to give you advice unless you ask for it. So, and actually that has made, that has, we all, we all have to make our own journey as a parent. And that includes going down some paths that don't work out, certainly. But you know what? I think as a result of that, I am she asks me for advice quite frequently. So when I started with your book, I said, okay, I just got to tell you, I'm reading this amazing book and I don't know if you want to know anything about it, but if you like, and they're like, yes, yes, yes. So that was good. But I think that, you know, that's, that's an important thing. One thing that happens in that family is each, you, you know, you're not going to have a cookie for dessert if you don't eat your meal. And the inside of me goes, but I'd keep my mouth shut. But so, but that is that reward thing. And it's so easy to go to, but it, set, it sets up so many difficult mindsets. I love about that. You don't have to like the rule. I love also the comfort I will find with, with each of these kids because they're very strong personalities. It's, I almost visibly see them relax when they know that this is a directive, not a choice. Sometimes they fight so hard to win what they perceive as a battle that when you say what is going to happen is you're you're going to take a bath. We, we are leaving the we are leaving the pool in five minutes. We are. It's almost like oh okay, I don't have to fight that battle. I sometimes see visible relaxation when you're given a directive, when given a directive. And and what I love about what you do is you give us the language to use. And I read, I was listening to another book while I was narrating yours, and it was about cast. It's the cast book that's big on Oprah. And, and one chapter, I believe it was that book, one chapter was about the cast system in dogs. And the uh, alpha dog, if the alpha dog has to bark loudly to get the pack in line, they've lost their power. <laughs> and I thought, my God, yeah. that's so true. Yeah. As a parent, look, we're parents, we're human, we all lose it, it happens. Um, but when I see, and I see my daughter and my son-in-law use the techniques, some of which they were already familiar with, there are podcasts and there are things that they follow, but in your book, everything's spelled out so beautifully. When I see them do a friendly distraction or just change their tone of voice, and I see the kids visibly relax around, sometimes kids don't wanna have the choice. If you let a kid decide, go to bed whenever you want to. I mean, I see the four-year-old well, just freak out if she has a decision to make sometimes. Yeah. And, and so giving them a directive is a gift. If the yeah, directive makes sense. I think it's sense. all in the way, I think it, the mind shift is that um, limits and boundaries are loving. It's not a lot of times when I'm talking to families and they're describing the, these scenarios, I realize this was another mindset that 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 I became very aware of is that parents tend to think they're either loving or they're setting limits. It's very bifurcated, where in fact, as you're saying so eloquently, Randy, limits and boundaries are loving. And it is why kids love school and tend to be much more organized and self-regulated in school because everything is crystal clear. There's no gray zone. And that that there's no anxiety about like, what can I exploit here? 
They know that if they want to be able to participate in circle time, they have to put their backpack, right? They know if they want to go to play, they need to put their, you know, their, their plate of snack in the garbage can. Right. They know that if they want to play interactively with the other kids, they can't be knocking people's towers over or destroying their artwork. And so they, and the, and teachers tend to respond because they don't have the same emotional connection and they've got years and years of training right. on how to sensibly and effectively acknowledge a child's experience while at the same time setting those boundaries. And I think that's really a, a, so important because like, let's just take sleep, for example. If you don't set the limits and boundaries, what tends to happen is this protracted power struggle that can go on for hours where parents end up so angry and stressed and frustrated um, and the, the, the interaction is so charged and negative between the parent and, and the child, that scenario, that dynamic is way more detrimental to a child than saying, here's the deal, sweetie. We're going to do this awesome bed, bedtime routine. We're going to read books. We're going to sing songs. We're going to have some cuddle time. We're going to say our special mantra. And then it's going to be lights out. I know you never want to say goodnight. It's never going to be enough books. It's never going to be enough cuddle time. We totally get that. We're not trying to convince you to agree with the program. That's a mommy daddy decision. Um, but And we have total faith in you that you will get yourself to sleep. You'll figure that out. And then you set the bed. So powerful. It's, it's put even, and this is gonna, I don't wanna get us into a whole nother realm because this is a real trigger for parents, but often the, the, the key is to be able to put a boundary, to be able to, when your child keeps coming out, that negative back and forth is, is way more detrimental than saying, no problem, sweetie, you have two great choices. If you want the door open, you stay in your room. That's the only rule. You figure out how to get yourself to sleep. That's your job. Our job is to make sure you stay in your room because coming out and going to sleep too late and getting your mind and your body overexcited at bedtime is not healthy. And so if you don't choose option A, which is to stay in your room and have the door open, no problem will be a helper and will put up Mr. Gate and he'll help you stay in your room. So it's all, the reason I say two great choices, even though as my friend across the street says, oh, I know what that is, Claire. That's what we used to call the choice of no choices, <laughs> which it really is. But I say two great choices because it puts parents in a mindset that is positive. Like this is not a battle. I'm sending a really important limit. And I love you so much. I'm setting the limit because what I'm not going to do is get into a protracted power struggle that is really detrimental to both of us. So I'm not asking you to like it, but you've got those two great choices. And choice B always has to be something you control. Um, because you as the parent, you mean? You yes. As the, so yes. it's like, I know, sweetie. You don't want to stop playing. Who wants to stop playing? It's time to get in the car seat. Here's my new thing. If you want to be in charge, so it's very important because that's what the kids want. Under That's in their DNA. They're not doing any, they're not misbehaving when they're obfuscating about getting in the car seat. They're just expressing that this is not something that they want to do right now. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. What... When you say, if you don't get in the car seat, you know, the bribes, the threats, the logic, we're going to get to school late. Don't you want to see your friends? They're like, no, I don't want to see my friends. I hate my friends. I mean, they just come out with they the come most up with anything. The, exactly. and, and it's so, ridiculous. And then you right. start worrying that they're antisocial. And it's just like, right. they're just coming right. up with it's, stuff. And it's just usually the transition. They love school. The transition is hard. If you have that mindset, then you're able to say, you know, but I know. You've got two great choices. If you want to be in charge, you can go into the car seat however you like. You can hop like a bunny. You can race like Roadrunner. If you choose not to, no problem. I'll be a helper. And if they run away and obfuscate, you scoop them up. You don't say a word about what they're doing or stop kicking and screaming because you're only then 
amplifying the power struggle. You're talking about what you see outside, the great things he's going to do at school. You strap him in, you get in the car and you act like nothing happened. You're just doing your job. You're just yeah. showing them I get that you're looking for power. I'm going to give you lots of choices, but it's not a choice about whether we're getting to school on time. And right? it's, firm, it's firm, but loving. I and mean, it's very interesting because part of what you're saying that I'm hearing is, and I, so I raised a son and a daughter. I remember growing up reading a book about mothers and sons and it says the mother will go you know, it's your turn to take out the garbage and you didn't take out the garbage yesterday and mommy's really tired. You know, mommy works really hard and I don't understand why you don't take out the garbage. And a father, I'm stereotyping, but this is what the book says, might be more likely to say, Dan, garbage now. And they will respond much more to fewer words. And I always, and I tell my son now who is is uh, dealing with an issue where he's trying not to use pot and he has friends that want to, and he doesn't know what to say to them. And I said, the more you say to them, the more loopholes they're going to find. If you just say, no, thank you. It's not for me. And you walk away. That's much more powerful than I'm trying to stop. And I went to a meeting last night or, you know, whatever. So sometimes more language means more loopholes. I used to call my son the loophole kid. So um, this is so uh, so interesting. And we've told a couple of stories. Let me t let me. Um, this, here's how, how I want to do the rest of this one. And boy, would I love to do this more often with you. I want to just run down the eight mindsets that are original. And you can tell me the mind shift set. And then I'd like to get specific about a few things. One is um, a concept in your book about worry brain and thinking brain and how you explain that to a kid. Um, totally selfish here because I'm dealing with things that my family is dealing with, but hopefully. And I'd like to ask you about sibling rivalry and, and the part of their brain that wants to rat, reach out and scratch their sibling and how what language we can use to help them manage that very instinctual fight or flight instinct. Are those things we can talk about? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to give you the faulty mindsets and you tell me what I can replace them with. Okay. So number one is my child, You did. we did this one, my child's misbehaving on purpose. He should be able to accept limits and exhibit greater self-control. The shift okay, would be- Okay, so too. the mind shift is this, that we know from a robust body of research over the last 20, 30 years in children's brain development that like you said, Randy, that they're largely still driven by what we call their downstairs brain. So even downstairs though, brain, like brain. even though by three, many children can repeat the rule. Like you can say like, do we hit? Oh no, we don't hit. You know, do we keep our food at the dinner table? Oh yeah, we keep our food at the dinner table. Do we stay in bed at night? Yes, we stay in bed at night. But when push comes to shove in the moment, almost always their impulses are going to override what they know. So that's one thing. The other thing that's really important is yes, like children will choose to do things. Like you will see a child like pick up, you know, they're mad because you say TV time is over and they toss the phone or the tablet or they do something that is perceived. What like no child sets out to misbehave. It really, what we understand now is it means there's a delta between the stressor that they're dealing with and, and their ability to cope with it. So if you see it from that perspective, so like a child may bite, no child sets out to be hurtful to another person. If you see that your child was triggered by a big feeling, did not have the tools to manage it, and therefore bit to purge himself of excess anxiety or um, as a way to um, show that they're angry about that. If you, if you see it from the perspective that my child is purposefully misbehaving, you're gonna respond very harshly. If you see it as their inability they don't have the tools to cope with it. You're going to come at it from more of a teaching and loving perspective. So you're, of course, you're not going to let your child bite, but here's the difference. 
the difference would be, you know, that's it. Stop biting. Why are you hurting me? You know, um, what's wrong with you? Go to your room. Right. Or even asking for reasons. You yeah. Like, why why you did you do that? Right. That, is, that you never get an answer. Right. Or, or they say something insane. Like yeah. they say, because they know you're trying to get an answer from them and they don't really know why, because it was impulsive. And so they make something up. In this model, it would be like, oh, no, oh, we don't bite people, but remember people have feelings. Let's find you something else to bite. I know you really need to sink your teeth into something. So you would definitely stop the behavior, but when you use shaming, what's wrong with you? Why are you hurting your brother? Nobody's going to want to play with you if you hit them. What happens is, and by the way, this happens for adults too, is when we're shamed, which is a very toxic emotion, we get flooded. Our brains get flooded with this overwhelming sense of shame, like what is wrong with me? And they, they're not able to think or problem solve, which is exactly what we want them to be doing. We wanna teach them um, that biting um, doesn't feel comfortable to other people, but I get you and I see you need an outlet and I'm gonna help you do that in a loving way. That scenario is much more likely to lead to a child no longer biting. So that's the reason why you want to make that mind shift and really say to yourself, what is the challenge here that my child's trying to cope with? Like, like the swimming pool example you gave earlier on, mm -hmm. this child was not complying because she did not want to get out of the pool. That's just because at three or four or five, you're, you're going to be largely driven by what you want. So when that dad was able to understand it from that perspective, he was able to move forward in that loving way with the two great choices and helping her move on without shaming her, without causing a negative interaction between the two of them. It doesn't mean she's going to say, thank you so much for getting me out of the pool so I can learn to accept limits. Yeah. So expecting them to like the limit, right? So, right. so he, he didn't join her upset, he said, I get it. I don't expect you to like the rule. It's totally, I get your upset, but it's time to leave. And when he stayed calm and loving, that helped her also calm. And there's of course, right. a lot of research about mirror neurons and how when children are spiraling, if you spiral alongside them, you're only gonna amplify the dysregulation, not, not get to sort of the, the positive outcome you're looking for. Okay, so that's a mind shift one. Your child is not misbehaving on purpose. It's hard for them to accept limits. While we're here, you, you bring up biting. I'm gonna bring up scratch marks on two sisters 19 months apart because that, and then they're sorry. They say sorry that, you know, and uh, so if there's a way to prevent that behavior, like I've been trying, in this family, we don't scratch each other, even if we sometimes feel like it. What do you, and this isn't a calm moment, what do you think we can do when we feel like scratching? What can we do instead? And so they've, they said, oh, we can put our hands on our laps, we can hit a pillow, but I don't know if that's gonna help in the moment when their instinct goes, I'm mad at this person because, because she has a toy that I didn't want five minutes ago, but she took it and now I want it. Like, so is there a way, you know, sibling rivalry is a whole thing that yes. we could do a whole show about, but yeah. is, is there a healthy way you can think of to, to cut down the instances of, of, and it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens enough to bother us. So yeah. physically well, lashing raising, out because. Of course, right. And you're raising, I mean, whether it's scratching or grabbing toys or pushing or doing something that's right. physical between siblings. I mean, this is very common. And I will say that the sibling relationship is incredibly complex um, and one of the most vexing challenges most parents deal with. And of course, in the context of this, we're not going to be able to go in deep. There are a lot of great resources on that that I'm happy to share that you can share with your audience to dig deeper into this. But Here's a couple guiding principles I would say when it comes to these kinds of sibling dynamics. One is that it's critically important to avoid being a referee and shaming one child or defending one child from another, even when they are doing something like scratching or pushing or grabbing or hitting. Because already 
it, the sibling rivalry is often intense. And when you insert yourself to protect one child from the other, it only amplifies the sibling rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so given that, how I would approach it would, if it's a pattern, the first thing I would do is sit down with the child and say, look, sweetie, I know it's, it's like having your brother, I'm making this up. I, I don't know which child you're talking about, but I it's, might say you it's know, two sisters in this case, but it could sisters. be a sister, so brother, it could be anything. Right. There's three very right. close in age. Right. So. so here's the deal. Like having a sister is awesome. And I know it's great. You have so much fun together and you love having her. And then there are other times where it's not so great and you're having a hard time figuring out how to play together or how to share, or she does something you don't like. I get it. Like all those feelings can coexist. That's the first message is you want to be clear that it's, it's like the feelings are never the problem. And the more you can address the feeling and validate the feeling for the child, not shame them. Like, why are you doing that to your sister? Yeah. I, I think so, we pretty much set that, set that up because yeah, okay, it's, it, it's, um, you know, boy, having a sister is great sometimes and having a sister right. sometimes not right. so great. Or right. when do you feel angry? You know, so we've set that up in advance. Okay. And then, so then I would add, so you guys have to figure out how you're going to play together. You got to figure out your relationship. That's your job. As the mom and dad, our job is just to make sure everybody is safe emotionally and physically. So when we see somebody having a hard time doing that, which is going to happen, we're going to be helpers. That's, that's why, by the way, like you see, I use a lot of very specific language. It's strategic that I actually, at this point in my career, feel like I don't even use the word discipline anymore because even discipline feels sort of harsh and punitive. Yeah, You're just a helper. You're mm -hmm. just saying to your child, I'm going to help you with that because I know you don't mean to be harmful, but scratching is uncomfortable to other people. So here's what we're going to do. When I see you having a hard time controlling your body, I'm going to be a helper. I'm going to remove, give you something else to scratch and we can figure out how to solve the problem using our voices and our brains as opposed to our bodies. So let's be realistic a lot of home visits. And I actually, I feel like my book, that's part of why it's so relatable because I'm in the trenches. And a lot of, of times, like the books sort of talk theoretically about things, but in reality, they don't work because of how intense these moments can happen. You can't, you can't avoid every one of those scenarios. You, you can't prevent every hit and push and kick and scratch. But over time, if you do the same thing, you don't shame the child, but you're very clear that you're going to keep everybody safe and you are going to help them find other ways to express themselves, you will start to see a reduction because the idea is to give them the tools. So you can have that conversation and talk about other things they can do, which is great, but you also have to in, pre be prepared in the moment to act but not say, why are you scratching your sister? It's literally, oh, no scratching. I even tell parents not to say the name of the other child. Because once you say like, don't hit your sister or why are you scratching Lucy? The optics are mommy's protecting Lucy from me. I'm the bad guy. And that only reinforces um, the sibling rivalry and this like, this, this sort of, bifurcation of one's the vic one's always the victim and one's always the aggressor, which you, you can see right. how that can. So that's what you do. You respond in a way where you're definitely setting a limit, but you're going at it from a teaching perspective, as opposed to a shaming what's wrong with you. Right. You're, you're a danger to your sibling perspective. That's fantastic. So I can't believe we've been chatting for almost an hour. So I'm let, let's just finish the mindsets. And I want to share with you a couple of other success stories that your techniques have, have done. Um, so two, um, instead of the mindset of when my child tries to get her way, she's being manipulative. We should, when, we should think you have an amazing strategic child. If you can just, if you can just replace manipulative with strategic, 
it will put you in a completely different mindset. If you think your child is manipulating you, by the way, I can't tell you how many times parents come into my office or on my telehealth platform and say, we have a fascist dictator living in our home. My, the, my favorite is the dad who recently said, I just want you to know that my three-year-old is extorting us. She will come to the dinner table, but only if she can bring her tablet and watch Peppa Pig. So, so if you think your child's manipulating you, you are going to come on harshly, punitively, all the threats, all that gray zone stuff, trying to right. get them to change their mind. Yeah. If you see really what is happening is your child is very clever and has figured out the system. She is going to do amazing things in this world. It's your job to show her which strategies work and which strategies don't work. Right. Yeah. So, so let's just take this one about the, the um, you know, the extortion of I'll only come to the table yeah. if I can bring my, my um, tablet. Um, and I have a whole article on this, so I'm going to try and be succinct, but to me, and it's actually, that story is in the book. I remember it well. So, right. So in, in short, the antidote is to say, I totally get it. So like she, if you see it as she just is trying to see if she can get what she wants, which is in the DNA of Of a child, that's the, then you can say, you know what, sweetie, there's no tablets at the table. Um, tablets go away at dinner time. We're going to be sitting here eating and great conversation. It's your body. You need to figure out like whether you're going to fill it and sit with us or not. We can't make you sit here. Remember you have to, your starting point has to be what in this little scenario do I control and not control? Right. If your child is no longer in a high chair strapped in a, in a booster seat, if you make it your goal to get your child to sit at that table, your entire dinner is going to be nagging, cajoling, bribing, threatening, and very, very maddening, unhealthy situation. It's much healthier to say, this is the amount of time we have for dinner. This is what we're going to be doing. You decide. But when the timer goes off, dinner's over. And the next chance we eat is breakfast. So you decide. And I know that's probably raising more questions and answers, but the case is in the book. And I go in great detail into this, but you have to set up a system where you are not trying to control your child's behavior, but you're controlling the situation. You're you're scaffolding it so that your child learns to make good decisions um, and then lets go of some of these strategies when they no longer work. If, if, if now threatening not to go to sleep or not to come to the dinner table no longer has any power, that's when you start to see adaptation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, and I can vouch for the fact that all of these techniques are spelled out in great and approachable detail in the book. There's phrases that I have come automatically to me now, like, well, for a while, one of the children had a problem with just controlling their potty, you know, holding it as long as humanly possible and beyond, you know. And when I just started saying, oh, your body's telling you it can hold it. Okay. Like just give, you know, give the choice back to the, suddenly thing, things are better. And, and is, is your belly, is your belly full? Like just making it about their body is huge. Okay. Um, so we, we've covered some of these. So number three, the old mindset is I can control and change my child's feelings and behavior. Obviously we just spoke about that. And I, we don't have to like the, the, you know, the mind shift is I can't, make my child do anything. What I control is my own reaction and the situation in many of the examples I've already given. So you can't literally, you can't like make your child get into the car seat. It's his body, but you can give the two great choices, which has an ultimate outcome of you being a helper and getting your child into the car seat so you can move on. And there's no protracted power struggle. Right. And, and I was saying, you know, a little part of this in my head keeps coming the old super nanny show with, uh, you know, because I think there were some techniques there that were helpful as well, which is basically, I love you. This is what we're going to do. I saw her struggle with families, with bedtime, and there's so many issues. 
Uh, I think children are comforted by the fact uh, I've also narrated three books on Montessori. So <laughs> I know, oh, okay. you know, that children are, and I find with my own children and these grandchildren that they do, they are, whether they think they're going to be or not, they're comforted by limits. They're comforted by loving limits. They know I have a friend who ran a daycare. And she told me once that if she took the kids outside and it was the situation where there was a sidewalk and she said, ride your bike as long as I can see you, that was too stressful for them. If they said you can ride your bike to that tree or that tree, but no further, then they took full advantage of the limits and went all the way from one tree to another. That right. Limits- the guardrails, having it's think about it. It's this, so many of these things apply to us as adults. And I, I, I provide a lot of those analogies, which really give parents an aha moment. It's sort of like, if you have a job and your boss kind of says, you know, well, you get it when you get it. Like it's very, it causes a lot of anxiety for right. most people not to know what to expect. People tend to like, like, this is what I need on Wednesday. And this is what I need on Friday because it's organizing. It gives you some structure that is calming and helps, you know, how to respond, how to comport yourself. And this, the, the very same thing is true for kids. It's all the way you do it. So you're right, Randy. It's not like, it's not like, because I said so, that's the shift is it's, it's, we're going to do this because this is safe and healthy for you. I don't expect you to like it. I don't expect you to like the fact that I'm limiting screen time. I I rarely met a kid who said, thank you so much for taking the tablet away (laughs) that I can do more edifying things with my mind and my Mm -hmm. body. So, but you're not justifying it. You're not trying to convince your child to be like, oh, good idea. Let me give you the tablet. You're saying, this is our rule. We don't expect you to like it, but you have two great choices. You can give the tablet back when you're done, or I'll need to be a helper and take it. That might feel really uncomfortable. Like, I don't want to have to do that, but the tablet is going to go away. When you do that one or two times, the power struggle's done. The child gets that tablets going away. And if they don't want you taking it out of their hands in that uncomfortable way, that they have another great option, which is to hand it to you. And that's what frees children to make the right decision. When you stay in that gray zone where you're trying to get them and the guardrails aren't clear, that is very uncomfortable for kids because they don't know anything to do, but to exploit it. That's why the guardrails are so important. Yeah. So this is such really good stuff. And I, you know, I will say that we will end in two or three minutes with Claire telling you how to get the book and the other resources that you have, because we can't possibly do justice to all of these eight mindsets and mind shifts in, in one show, but so much valuable information. I'll just mention the others. Number four, the old mindset that experiencing difficult emotions is harmful Obviously it's right, not. Right. And I, you know, I've, I've learned human. to let the storm pass and say, right. okay, you need to have emotions right now. Uh, five, it's mean and rejecting not to give my child what he wants or needs. I think we've covered that the, we can think differently about that. Six, experiencing failure is harmful for my child. I love that because last night when I was, there's a thing called brain quest, which are little questions and answers you ask. And when um, the four-year-old, didn't get one right. She said, oh, all right, I guess I didn't get one that one right. Everybody makes mistakes. And she moved on because we have modeled that, you know, I say, oh, grandma made a mistake like this. So, you know, it's uh, so that's the it's OK if they fail. That's we need to tell ourselves that not just a child. Number seven, um, be aware if you're having this old mindset that providing directions and expectations is harsh and dictatorial. I think you have already spoken about the, the um, mind shift away from that. And that eight, my, my child harbors malicious intent when she is aggressive. Uh, that brings up the, the up, upstairs and, and downstairs brain. My last specific question to you is what's the best language to in a calm moment, explain to a child the difference between upstairs brain and downstairs brain or thinking brain and worry brain. I think you used that. So they're actually, so quickly, um, the, they're a little different. What I would, what I think the upstairs brain, downstairs brain is more something the parent 
needs to keep reminding themselves, right? That the of child ourselves, is okay. more, when is, is more driven and that when they're triggered and dysregulated, it's because their downstairs brain has taken over and they don't have access to their thinking brain. Okay. Right. That, that's, that's, that's sort of the a, an amygdala hijack. I've heard that called, which I love. Yeah. The amygdala so, takes over and says, right, exactly. Yeah. And if you see it that way, you can stay calm and realize that you need to get your child back to calm to be able to think about whatever the specific problem was. What you're asking about the worry versus a thinking brain is a little different. So what I came, I came up with this concept about how to help children with fears and where they get very flooded and they can't think and reality test about whether they really need to be afraid about that. So you get a lot of parents saying, oh, you don't have to be worried about that. You can go down that big slide. You're amazing. Or you can go to school. You'll be fine. Like there's a lot of just sort of talking. Cheerleading. Cheerleading. Yeah. Exactly. Which I talk a lot about in the book, which is, I mean, look, let me just say everything parents do is the parents I see are totally motivated because they love their children and they want them to be happy. It's just that often inadvertently it has the opposite response. It's so much of good parenting is completely counterintuitive, right? Mm, So like, like tantrums aren't harmful. Allowing the tantrum is one of the best things you do because it's ultimately what helps your child build the resilience and grit to muscle through a difficult situation. If you're constantly trying to take them out of their misery, they never learn that skill. So getting back to the worry and thinking brain, what I found helpful is to say to a child, um, you know, they're like, oh, 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 you know, I can't get in the pool. I'm going to drown. Right. You're like, oh, I think your worry brain has taken over. Did you know, bud, that there's actually different parts of your brain? There's like the memory part of your brain, which helps you remember things. And then there's the thinking part of your brain that helps you solve problems. And you give them real life examples of how they've used these different parts of their brain to make it concrete. And then you say, then there's this worry part of our brains that make us think that something's scary or we can't do something when we really can, but it's kind of tricking us. And when that happens, we need to call on our thinking brain to help our worry brain. And then you go through the steps. So like in this case with the swimming, it's like, okay, oh, worry brain's taken over. Let's get thinking brain over here. Thinking brain, let's see. So, um, you know, is um, is is so and so is the teacher? Because in this case, I'm thinking of the child was in a swim class and he thought maybe the teacher was going to let him drown. So you say, let's just watch. Let's watch the 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 um, class. Don't you never force a child. Let's watch and see. Oh, what's our? Oh, I think our thinking brain is saying that the teacher gives kids floaties or they hold on to the side or she, you know, you point, you you then do the reality testing where you can help them see, but you're doing it in this kind of fun way where you're really helping them feel like they have more control over it because they have this thinking part of their brain that can help their worry brain. And so you take them through the steps um, that helps them gain some sense of control and often helps them overcome the fear. Like, oh, I'm afraid I'm gonna fall off the slide. Okay, I thinking brain is wondering, what about if mommy holds your hand? Oh, okay, well, should we be detectives and see whether that's something your worry brain needs to be worried about? And that's another great strategy is when you just, you're just being a detective. Like, let's just see if it should be scary. And it's funny, once you, make it pretend or you make it practicing or you make it investigating, they are in a completely different mindset themselves. And all of a sudden they're open to trying new things. So a lot of this is elucidated in the book, but there's lots of little strategies you can use that help children manage their, their, their big emotions. Absolutely. And I will say in the, um, There are a lot, I'm an improv actress as well. And there are a lot of improv techniques that we use even in corporate training. And when you're brainstorming a a solution to a problem, instead of saying, why don't you? We say, what if, it's just a very, you know, words, I'm writing a book called Happier Made Simple and the way words trigger emotions just on their own. I love that. Yeah. what, What if? Yeah which is great. And I have learned with, with each of the kids when they're frightened about something to 
I guess they say relearned because, you know, I'm not saying I was a bad parent, but there's always more to learn. Parenting is the most humbling thing ever. And grandparenting <laughs> reminds you of that. I, I just cheerleading and get, when they don't feel like going into the soccer game or whatever, you give a great example in the book. I, you know, we are, so we have a pool, one child fish immediately. Uh, the youngest one getting to be a fish, but, but young, uh, the middle one is not sure. And we have steps and I stopped cheerleading her. I'm like, you decide, Oh, you, okay. I see that you put your feet in this on the first step. Hmm. And if she, I see her wanting to go down the next step and being afraid. And, and I'm like, I'm here to keep you safe, but whatever you decide is fine. It's your body. You're in control. Like I just keep saying yeah. that. And well, then all yeah, of a sudden yeah. she'll jump to me because it's her decision. So you've given us so much today, Claire, honestly, I hope that any parents out there and, and grandparents will learn from just this podcast, just this presentation. But why don't you tell us uh, where we can get the book and uh, any other resources you want to let us know about. And we'll, we'll end with that. But just thank you. This is so great. And I can tell you that the book, the audio book, I hope it succeeds greatly, not because there's anything in it for me financially. That's not the point. I just think the messages are so well-developed and, and it, humanely presented that I think it'll help a lot of parents. So tell us about the resources. Um, so um, there's many different ways to get the book. Um, it Right now, the publisher, Roman and Littlefield, and by the way, all of this is on my website. So really, if you just go to learnerchilddevelopment.com, the navigation bar has a whole tab about my book. You can read excerpts, you can see the advanced praise, and you can see the five different ways. Of course, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on many independent bookstores. Um, but right now, the publisher, Roman and Littlefield, is offering a 35% discount for pre-orders. So anybody who orders the book before August 31st, because the book launches on September 2nd, can actually get the book for 35% off. Um, and all of this can be found on my website, with links. Um, I also am active on Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I have a very active blog where I am constantly writing about these in the weeds issues. Every time I come up, um, uh, every time I see a, families who are struggling with a common issue, I write about it. So like the concept of cheerleading, you know, really helping parents dissect what is the child really experiencing. It's not what you intend them to experience. I'm doing a lot of helping parents really see it from their child's perspective, which helps them make course corrections that are life-changing for everybody. And so I do a lot of writing. You can follow my blog, but really the best thing to do is to go on the website um, go to the book tab and see all the different ways that you can order the book. Does that make sense? That makes so much like sense. Like one, one stop shopping. One stop shopping. Absolutely. And my hope is that a lot of people will listen to this and benefit from it. And you know, maybe you and I can chat about doing quick 10 minute audio bites. I don't know. Just I, I just think that there'll be a lot of happier families if they take your book to heart. And, and we're all about happier families. Well, so. I love that. Yeah, I'd be yeah. happy to do that. I, I love um, helping parents see things from a new lens and, and, and find more joy really um, is really sort of my goal. A lot of my, what I wish I had done, quite honestly, <laughs> a, lo a lot of what's in that book are sort of a lot of 2020 hindsight. Boy, oh boy, don't, that's part of the humble <laughs> humility of parenting. I'm excited to, I'm excited to practice it as a grandparent. That's what I'm looking forward to. And by the way, I still use these, these mindsets with my own 28 and 30 year old, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, even though the book is really the cases are largely children six and under, because that's largely my practice. The truth is when I give talks and I meet with families who have older kids, they're like, oh my God, all of this really applies to really the, all of my children at different ages. So I, I actually hope that it will be accessible to, you know, to parents of older kids, but also 
that parents of younger children who are not even, let's say two, and they're not necessarily in that challenging behavior stage. Right. What I'm finding is parents who read it when I've given it to friends with kids who have very young children, it's preventative because once they, they get, they get into the mindsets and they read the stories, they now can anticipate. So when their children start to protest and draw them into power struggles and have tantrums, they see it through a totally different lens than they might have. And it sets them on a path that actually prevents many of these challenges. So I actually am hoping that it will reach an audience of parents of kids, maybe between like one and two who might not pick up the book because they're not yet ensconced in sort of all of these challenging behaviors. Everyone has said, oh, they don't give you a manual when you become a parent. Well, there's one available now. It's coming out September 2nd. Clear Learner, it's been a delight. Me too. Thanks so much, Randy. 